Okay, there's a lot of really kind of weird stuff thrown into section seven. Most of the stuff is not heavily emphasized on an AP test and probably won't be heavily emphasized on one of my tests either, but I will go over all of it with you. So one thing that we do have to understand throughout the year is object references and they show up in some strange ways, okay? So an object reference is what an object really holds on to. When I write student X equals new student, if I say uh, zombie dog Y equals new zombie dog, those variables X and Y that we call objects, they don't hold on to the name of the zombie dog or the age of the student or the ID number or any of that stuff. You could have a hundred attributes within an object, but the variable doesn't really hold on to all that. It holds on to something called the reference, which is really just some strange binary code that some people call it like a memory address. Like it, in other words, it's like a path that takes you to where all of that stuff is. So the, the object doesn't actually hold on to all the different values, like the attribute values. It just tells you how to get to them. So it refers you as to like how to go find them. Okay. And that's what we call a reference. So in this problem here, I've created a couple different things. I've got a parent class and a parent has a name and whether or not they're retired. And I've got a student class and the student has a name and an ID number. I could add 10,000 more attributes here, but I was a little lazy, so I didn't bother to. Okay. But the bottom line is when you create a student and you give it a name and you give it an ID number, S1 doesn't hold on to those. S1 simply holds on to something that we call a reference, which is like a memory address. And it's, a, it's like a path as to where to go find all that stuff. Uh, in fact, we could print out what this memory address is. And so I did that right here. I said, print S1 for me. Now, what it's going to do, what its default behavior is, is to display that reference under a set of rules. And this is one way that we could display that reference. It's meaningless to me. I don't, I don't know what 76ED5528 is. What that is, is it's, it's, it's a bunch of hex symbols. Hex is like a, a numbering system that goes from zero to 15 instead of zero to nine. And since we don't have digits that go that high, we use A, B, C, D, and F. You, you don't really need to know all that right now. Uh, but the bottom line is that's, that's some weird binary code, okay? So that, that could be like two to the 32nd power. You have all these 32 bit, like all these different memory addresses you can create. And it's attached to a student object. So we maybe the computer knows what that means, but I don't know what it means. But apparently you could find a student at this location within your computer's memory. That's what S1 holds on to. Some, some value that, again, to me is meaningless. I don't even know what it is. But that reference then can take you to that student and it could retrieve the attributes of that student. And that reference could be used to run any methods from the student class. So it's, it's kind of like an intermediate step, okay? It's, it's connecting the dots, it's a reference, it's referring you as uh, to go get this other information. So again, it's not holding on to, it doesn't know anything about Joe Cool or one, two, three, four. It just knows where it can go get that stuff. All right, now, if I made a student like this, I didn't actually make a new student. What I did was I just aliased the student that already existed. So S2 and S1 are the same student with different, I don't know, different objects, okay? They got the same reference behind them, but they have like different names. So it's kind of like you guys call me Mr. Zerla, okay? My friends call me Brian or just Zerla. My kids call me dad. So I'm one person, but I've got different names that you can refer to me by, okay? Right now, we've only got one student, okay? We've got different names that we can refer to that student by, different objects. We can call it S1 or we can call it S2. It's the same student. And we see that right here because it actually printed the same reference, okay, for S1 and for S2. You'll notice that I made another student, Bob Boring. Bob Boring got a different reference. Now where it gets a little bit weird is I made another student 
and I named that student Joe Cool, and I gave him the same ID number, but he was assigned a different memory address. So he's not the same student. S4 and S1 are not the same student. They might have the same name and they might have the same ID number. And we might think to us ourselves, well, that's stupid. Arcadia High School would never give two students the same ID number. Yeah, you're right. But, but I did here, okay? They're not the same person or they're not the same student. So they have a different memory address. They exist in two different places and they've got their own individual qualities. They might have the same values for them, but as far as we're concerned, they're two different students, okay? And we see that with their different memory addresses. And that's gonna be important in a minute when we start comparing these. All right, so just like primitive variables can only have one value at a time, objects can only have one reference at a time. If I came up here and I said, for example, S3 equals S4, then S3 would lose this reference, okay, whichever one took you to Bob Boring, and it would now take over, so it's going to lose this reference, 2C7B, and it's going to take over the one that goes to Bob Boring. And so now it's an alias of student S4. And so if we were to look at those two, they would now have the same memory address. Okay. And we can see that right here. So student S3 lost their memory address and took over S4s. In fact, Bob Boring would be lost forever. Okay. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't recover them. So, okay. Um, if we wanted to bring them back, we'd have to get rid of that line of code. Uh, all right. Now, we can compare object references using equals equals and not equals. But the only thing we can do with this is identify aliases. What, is it, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Remember earlier when I created two students that were both named Joe Cool with the ID number 1234, but one I called S1 and one I called S4? If I asked Java do S1 and S4 equal each other, Java would actually tell me false, okay? And we see that here. Java actually says false to that question because again, they're not the same student. They might have the same name, they might have the same ID number. I could give them a hundred other attributes, GPA, whatever. They're not the same, okay? They have different memory addresses. The only time we're ever going to get equals here to say true is if we've actually created an alias. And an alias is like I did here when I just said, let's just rename S1. We didn't actually make a new student. We actually just gave a second name, an alias, to S1. So if I asked if S1 equals S2, that would show up as true. Really, the only other way you're going to get true is if you compare something to itself. So if I ask if S1 equals S1, I get true. And then obviously the not equals operator might say true because that's the opposite. So like we said earlier, S1 equals S4 is false. So to say not equals would say true. If I brought back this line of code here and then I asked if S3 and S4 equaled each other, it would say true. They would be aliases at that point. Okay. If we don't want to, you know, if, if equals equals and not equals don't actually compare the contents of the objects, why would we ever use them? Like, why would we ever want to go around identifying aliases? Well, we're probably not ever going to, okay? It's, it's, it's probably rare that we would actually ever do this in our course. But what we might do is we might compare our reference to a kind of a special reference, the null pointer. And so sometimes we want to know if an object is actually holding on to a reference of any type, or is it actually holding just onto like this null pointer, which means that you haven't really initialized it yet. You haven't, you haven't. Okay. So there, there is no student reference there. Uh, instead, it's just holding onto this null pointer. Like it hasn't actually been initialized. And so here's some examples of that. So S1 and S2, you might remember earlier, I created students for them. And so to ask if they were null, both times says false. Now, S5, I actually initialized to null. And when I asked if it was null, it said true. Okay, in the future, when we work with arrays and array list, and also in writing classes, so this is gonna come up in like units five, six, and seven, 
by default, Java is going to initialize our objects to null if we don't say otherwise. And so we're going to have to be real careful in those cases because sometimes we might take a null reference and try to do something with it. And then we get an error message. So a lot of times we'll write protective code. Like we'll write something like this. Like, for example, I want to print the information of student one, but I only want to do so if I'm confident that S1 isn't a null pointer. And the way I wrote the method is it'll, it'll give me the name and the ID number. OK, but I, if I tried to do that on a null pointer, I'd get an error message. Now, I prevented it from happening here because I asked up front. I said, only do this if it's not null. If I get rid of that line of code, I'm going to crash the program. It's going to attempt to run a student method on a null pointer, and that's illegal. Okay, you can only call student methods on student objects, okay, which hold student references. The student reference steers you to the student class to find the instructions for what to do. The null pointer doesn't know to go looking into the student class to find that method. It doesn't know the difference between a student and a parent and a string and a zombie dog and anything else you can imagine. Okay, so only a valid student reference could point me to that student class, not the null pointer. So sometimes we'll ask about that. Like I said, this is going to make a little more sense when we get to like units five, six, seven, and we're going to encounter more null pointers. So I wouldn't worry about it too much now. But that is a case when we might actually compare object references using equals equals and not equals. All right. Now, so if the equals equals doesn't actually compare students like we saw here, it didn't look at their names. It didn't look at their ID numbers. Well, then then why, you know, would, how, how could we do it? I guess would be a better. How, how could we compare like the contents, the attributes, in other words, of the object? If you want to compare the attributes of an object, you got to write your own equals method. OK, in the string class, they did that. The authors of the string class wrote their own equals method. And so they took over the behavior of the equals method to compare the letters of a string. And in the parent class, I did that. I made a parent class equals method to compare the names and to compare whether or not they're retired. Those are the two attributes of a parent. And so if I initialized a few parents here, okay, like I've done, I could then start comparing them with my equals method. Now, most of the time here, you know, we might, we might get like a same result. We might not, let's, let's see what happens. This is kind of weird. So if you look at my parents, P1 and P2, they're not the same reference, right? If I printed those references, they'd be different, but they have the same attributes. And so this is where it gets really interesting. If you look at my first two print statements under this part, when we run it, it's going to give me a true on the first one, and it's going to give me a false on the second one. Now, in both cases, it was a parent named Jill Smith that had retired, okay? But... It only tested true when I used my personalized method. My method compared their names and the value of whether or not they were retired. Okay, that's not how this equals equals. This compared their memory addresses, their references. And like we saw earlier, differently created objects will get different references. They're two different things. They might have the same name. They might be both retired. There's probably a thousand people in America named Jill Smith that are retired. OK, so it's, it's not that surprising that we might have two that are actually different ones. If I'm only concerned about their contents, I have to write my own method for that purpose. And that's what I did here. I cannot change the behavior of equals equals, but I can change the behavior of dot equals. OK, does Jill Smith equal Sue Smith? No, no, those are both false. If you look at the alias that I created, P1 and P4, I actually got true both times now. That's because it's an alias. It actually did have the same reference. We didn't build a unique reference for it. We just copied the one from P1, okay? 
And therefore, P1 and P4, they're the same. They're both named Jill Smith and they're both retired. So that's why that's showing true in both cases. All right, now here's, it's gonna take another weird turn here. So in my student class, I didn't put an equals method, right? You, you can see for yourself, there's no equals method in here. All right, but here's where it gets crazy. I can actually use an equals method on students. There's a, de a default built-in equals method, but its default behavior is to act the exact same as equals equals. So what this dot equals method is doing is it's actually checking for an alias. It's only looking at the reference. And, and if you look, it's actually giving the exact same result every single time. So if one's false, the other one's false. If one's true, the other one's true. The only time it ever actually said true was right here. And that was because it was detecting the alias S4 equaled S1. Okay. They were aliased at that point. So it showed up true on both of them though. That's what was interesting. That didn't happen. You might remember in the parents. Uh, well, actually, I guess, I guess in the parents where the difference would have been right here. In the parent class, this one would have been true. Now it's false because it doesn't matter that they're both named Joe Cool. What mattered was is that they were created with two different references. So this time we didn't change the behavior to compare attributes. All right, now the string classes takes it even, even further into the craziness world. Okay, so the string class has an equals method and it has like, you know, the default behavior of the equals equals. But it, it even gets crazier now because what they've done is they've created something called the string pool, where if you create the same string more than once, Java doesn't bother to create a new reference to it. So these two strings actually share the same reference since they're both referencing the word mother. Uh, and so what that means is not only would dot equals say true, but so would equals equals. Now we've seen before that doesn't always work. And, and so we've got to be careful. Sometimes the string pool gets bypassed. One way to bypass it is like if you were to make a string through, say, a substring method or through a scanner or through the string constructor or various other ways, maybe through concatenation. But right here, if I substring smothered, I should get the string mother. And I've gone ahead and I put that into string three. And, and you can see that there in the display. It, it's clearly prints that it's mother also. OK. Now, here's where it gets crazy is if I ask then if string one equals string three, it says true. And OK, they both have M-O-T-H-E-R. But if I ask if string one equals equals string three, now it says false. Earlier, it said true. Now it says false. What on earth is going on? Well, it, it's, it's about that string pool. You can read more about it if you want, but you really don't have to. Here, here's what you got to remember. Okay, like here's the bottom line. The, the most important thing to take away from today. If you're going to compare strings, use the dot equals method. Okay, because you're trying to check if the letters are same. I can't think of a reason why you're going to want to check references to a string. All right. When you're comparing strings, you want to see if their letters are the same. Do they have the same letters? So use the dot equals method. It's going to work every single time. Don't rely on equals equals because it might not work. And we don't want to ever do anything that might not work. We want our code to work 100% of the time. Okay, so use dot equals when you're comparing strings. That's the most important thing to take away from today. The other thing we might in the future check for null pointers. Okay, but again, that's probably going to start up in another month or two when we get into like unit five. So don't worry about it too much just yet, but it is something to be aware of.